Welcome to the Potter's House Salmon Arm Podcast. We are a Bible-believing church located in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. We are proudly part of the Christian Fellowship Ministries with 3,000 churches around the world. We are a church focused on world evangelism, discipleship, and church planting. Here we will share recent sermons from PHSA Church and other sermons from throughout our fellowship. I am Pastor David Bigford, and I will be your host for this podcast. I thank you for listening today, and we hope these messages are a blessing to you and bring you closer to God. Hello, and welcome back to the Potter's House podcast. My name is David Bigford. I'm the pastor here in Sam and Arm. And I just want to welcome you to the podcast. If you're new or you're listening for the uh, you know first or second time, thank you for joining us. The message I have today is the three C's for growth, create, contribute, and care. The text I'll be using is Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. So if you have your Bibles, you want to follow along, you can turn there today. All right, perfect. So I found an illustration called Good Timber. It's a poem that came from Douglas Malick, and it's uh, it's pretty interesting, and I think it'll help us with, as we jump into our message today. The tree that never had to fight for sun and sky and air and light, that stood out in the open plain and always got its share of rain, never became a forest king, but lived and died a scrubby thing. The man who never had to toil to heaven from the common soil, who never had to win his share of sun and sky and light and air, never became a manly man, but lived and died as he began. Good timber does not grow in ease, the strong wind, the tougher trees, the farther sky, the greater length, the more the storm, the more the strength. By sun and cold, by rain and snow, in tree or man, good timber grows. Where thickest stands the forest growth, we find the patriarch of them both, and they hold converse with the stars, whose broken branches show the scars of many winds of many strife. This is the common law of life. So the question before us is, you know, how do we grow to be strong, to be resilient? How do we grow to be made of the right stuff? And that is Never more important than it is today, as we just had saw the Olympics kick off in France and the spectacle that's been made and the mockery that's been made of Christianity on a global stage. And everybody wants to say how you know brave it was for these people to do this, this mockery, but they would never try such a thing with other faiths, faiths that don't live by the tenets of Christ. No, they would actually be terrified of the violence that would occur if they were to do anything uh, of, you know, in regards to this with the other faith of Islam, especially given the demographics that have happened in Europe over the last decade or so. But we know that they fear the God that we serve. They fear Christ. They fear our Lord, because that's why they are so drawn to mock him. So these scraggly little men and and women that are on the global stage today, they're afraid of what it would take to actually grow and be strengthened. Because to grow grow and to be strengthened, you need to, to give your life to Jesus Christ. It takes the servant leadership of Jesus Christ to create a new heart in somebody. And that comes by hearing the good news that Jesus died for your sins, even the sins of those that mock him. That's also something that's a good thing for us to highlight at this point. With everything wicked that goes on in the world, one of the things I tell my children is that Jesus prayed for the Roman centurions as they were crucifying him. As he was being hung on the cross, he prayed for those people. So as we see in our world today, we see people who, you know, it's it's been said that 33% of Democrats in the United States are upset that the shooter who tried to assassinate Donald Trump missed. The wickedness of their heart leads them to such a dark place that instead of wishing or praying or crying out that there would be an enlightenment towards their view of the world, no, no, they, they would rather see death 
on those they disagree with. And that's a very dark and twisted thing. But that is not uncommon in our society today. But us as Christians, we have to weather these storms. We have to allow these things to change us in a way that edifies and glorifies Christ. We have to take it and allow it to strengthen us in light of what our our Father in Heaven and our Savior, Jesus Christ, would want. Something that we would be able to be a blessing unto them. And that comes by accepting the reality that the world is wicked, but that doesn't give us an excuse to share in their wickedness. So guard your hearts today as we get, jump into this word, but guard your hearts that you see the wickedness of the world and you do not wish ill on the people, but rather that you wish that the spirit or the conviction of the whole of God will deal with them in such a way that they will turn from their wickedness and seek salvation. For we are a church that strives to see people saved. We are a church that strives to see people restored and, and changed by the, the blood of Jesus. So they would go from being a Saul who's out seeking to kill Christians to becoming a Paul who is going out to the Gentile world so that they might be saved. Let's jump into our text in Matthew today, which is Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. And it's the parable of the tenants. For it will be like a man going on a journey who have called his servant and entrusted them to or to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five more talents. Also, he who had two talents made two talents more, but he who had received the one talent went and dug into the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with him. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he said, He also, who had Two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have, I scattered no seed. Then you ought, to, you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For everyone who has uh who for everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this parable explains what Jesus regards as faithfulness. Essentially, it involves using what God has entrusted to you to advance his interests in the world. It involves making a spiritual profit with the deposits God has entrusted to each disciple. We could see this more fully explained when we look at James 2 verses 14 through 26. This is a portion of scripture where we get the idea of faith without works is dead because we are saved by grace. And that is all God. But that changed heart that you receive when you give your life over to Christ and you receive that abundance of grace, it should change you enough 
that you should desire to do more. You should be part of the team, part of that community now, striving to do God's will. And it's not immediate. It's not overnight for everybody, but it should be something. There should be a change in your person. In verse 14, it says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you a foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by the works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that, saying that Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. We also see the parable of the ten virgins, which precedes our text. It speaks of salvation. But this one emphasizes the importance of our rewards and our and judgment. It sets the stage for our understanding of Christian growth. This is not about salvation, as I mentioned, but rather our ability to persevere and grow with that relationship of Jesus Christ and on that path of sanctification. We're not meant to sit idly by, letting the judgment of God come to those who have been saved had they just heard the gospel. So again, I touched on, you know, what we see happening in the world today and society as a whole, what the, what's happening in the, or at the Olympics. As Christian, our cry should be that they would turn to Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says, And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So this is the what we're always supposed to be looking for as part of our sanctification as we grow in Christ we're supposed to be seeking redemption of others as well. This brings me to my first point which is create more. How do we make the most of our time? What practices do we put in place to build the right habits and the right mindset? We're striving to genuinely feel fulfilled and focused in our lives and to create something worthy of the sacrifice that Lord made for us on Calvary. So I've been doing, you know, uh, for a while I was doing these things called the morning minutes. And they they were, you know, one to five minute posts on Instagram. The point of those videos was to, you know, it wasn't to become super popular. It wasn't to do them, you know, long term necessarily or to go viral. But the main reason I started doing those videos was it was a way for me to hold myself accountable for my prayer life. And for you know, putting a use to, to the reading of the Bible as I was going through it. And I might start those up again. You know, we, we got a different building. And so I've been able to go to prayer at our church building now. So it changed a little bit of my morning schedule. But it was, it was a method. It was something I put in place to just drive me to be accountable to the body of Christ. So here are the three C's of creativity. The first one is consume. Feed your brain and your spirit. So we should be purposeful in what we consume. We should be focusing in on the word of God, the Bible. And then you're obviously going to need to be up to date a little bit of what's going on in the world so that you can be able to reach people. So you should be paying attention to the news to some extent. So if someone comes up to you and goes, hey, what did you think of those, the, the opening ceremony of the Olympics, you at least know what they're talking about, and you can speak to it from a biblical perspective. And then, of course, there's things that are like your personal interests 
So I, I am trying to, you know, learn the piano and I'm trying to be better at bass guitar. These types of things are something that I find personally interesting, but it's also something I'm trying to, to hone or harness for the, you know, the mission field for the church. Then we're supposed to be, you know, uh, the second point or the, the three C's of creativity is, is to create. You got to know who your audience is. This, this comes into many facets, whether you're preaching the gospel, you need to know, you know, what's going on in your church to a certain extent, but even more so your friends at work, your friends that, you know, outside of work, someone you bump into the street, you want to know your audience so that you, you can leverage who, you know, what's important to them for the purpose of the gospel. Let your uniqueness show through. You don't have to change who you are. Oftentimes, your uniqueness is going to op open up doors to somebody's life that someone else might not be able to deal with. And then as you're putting together, you know, whether it's content creation, like I was doing with those morning minutes, or whether it's work, or whether it's, you know, the time you're spending with friends, you should focus over, you know, quality over quantity. You should be concerned with being a quality person. Nobody cares if you're around all the time. If, if when you are around, you're not bringing some sort of quality. That, that last servant who had the one talent, he was there. He was there when the master left. He was there when the master returned. But he, ref he did not bring any quality. He had his one thing. The others, they did bring more, but they brought it because of the quality of their character. And consistency is key. So framing, learning a language, learning an instrument, these kind of things, is you, you learn that you got to do something regularly in order for it to start sticking in your life. And lastly, out of this, this second point of creating things, of the three C's of creativity, is don't let perfection be the killer of good. Oftentimes you'll you'll see in different, I've even heard this from different churches. Wait till you learn a little bit more before you tell people about Jesus Christ or that you got saved. And I understand the idea behind this. For some people, it's like, don't let, don't tell a bunch of people because you're not strong enough in the Lord. But hey, I'm sorry, but if the conversion was real, if you really gave your life and you really felt a touch from God, we see Jesus telling people who, you know, he talked to, to go and preach the gospel fairly quickly. The woman of the well, he, he spoke into her life and she immediately went and became the best witnesser of the entire town. Probably in the history of the entire town, you know, even to this day. In Matthew 25, 24 through 25, which is part of our text. He, it, I'm going to repeat it. He says, he also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you didn't, you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. So this the, the third C of the three C's of creativity is making connections. It's to connect. Making connections, witnessing, and serving are critical to a Christian's life. Seeking out like-minded believers, people who believe in the full gospel of Jesus Christ as laid out in the New Testament and the Old. And targeting those whom you seek to help. So we seek to see people converted. So we spend a lot of time witnessing and outreaching. So that those who might not know the gospel or might be backslidden in their life have the opportunity to hear the gospel again and turn back. Jesus focused on the sick and the lost. We should be focusing on the sick and the lost. And then ultimately serve where you can. You might not be good at certain things, but I guarantee you there's going to be a way you could fit in and serve within the body. In 1 Peter 4, 9-11, through 11, it says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good steward of God's very grace. 
Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This brings me to my, my second point, which is contribute more. As we get more mature in Christ, we should be looking for more avenues to serve in the body of Christ. Some of us can teach, some can speak, some are great with numbers and finances, and some are a huge help in their service and support. One thing is for sure we all have, we're all going to have to give an account for the talents that God has given us. There's a great worth in the talents that God has given us. And that is why the parable of the talents is so interesting. The use of the term talent signifies something of great worth. In the scripture, the one talent that we're talking about here was equal to about 20 years worth of wages for the laborer. So in terms of American dollars, if we're looking at you know 2011, one talent would equal about $600,000. Multiplied by 10,000, the amount the servant owed in 1824, the debt would have been $6 billion. Jesus uses this illustration to show us that without forgiveness from God, our debt to him is impossible to pay. So I might, might have confused you there just for a second because it's you know mixing two different parts of Matthew. So in our text today, the 20, you know, we see that each talent's worth like $600,000. But in Matthew 18, 24, there's the, the tale of the servant who owed a, lot, a great deal. And his debt would have been like the equivalent of today of $6 billion. So these things are, you know, huge amounts of money. So this, it, there's importance, there's heaviness to this. He had the ability to do something, and he chose not to. In Romans 14, 12, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. In 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 4, it says, this is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't, do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. So if we're going to be regarded as servants, then we have to be expected to serve. This does not mean that, the sal that salvation depends on works. I've already touched on this. That is why you know, I included that passage from James earlier. What it does mean, though, is that once you're saved by grace and made a new creation in Jesus Christ, you should have the desire to partake in the same ministry that sets you free, that set all of us free. So we oftentimes overcomplicate the theology when in reality it isn't that complex. If you were shipwrecked and one of the sailors saved your life and pulled you onto the beach, you would be saved. Now, let's say you're a skilled carpenter. Would you withhold your talent in shelter building? Of course not. You would gladly help because you were safe. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11, it says, All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Creation and contribution go hand in hand. There's no purpose of creating for it its own sake unless it's either to benefit self or share it with others. Either option involves contributing to that creation to give it meaning. The more the creation contributes to the lives of others, the more meaningful the, in the creation. In the world, if the creator monetizes his output, it will be rewarded commiserate to how much it contributes to others. Contribution does not have to be of an original creation. Volunteer work is a contribution. A job is a contribution. If these efforts are meaningful to you, they are useful contributions. So in the Old Testament, specifically in the Pentateuch, wisdom was ascribed to the craftsman and the artist. These skills were meant to be shared. In the New Testament, we see there is equal honor given to those who serve humbly. Our King, Lord Jesus, gave the perfect example of servant leadership. And this brings me to my Final point, which is care more. This is from an article 
the three C's of continuous improvement by Jay Tomlinson. It's a, and so it's, it's structured for business. So just play along and we'll get to the bottom of this. While contributing more focuses on benefiting others, caring more, invo more involves a combination of external and internal fulfillment. If you personally have no interest in your creation, your sole purpose for creating is the sake of making an income. While money is necessary for survival, the reason behind making money must be established. You are making money in order to buy freedom. That is what financial independence is all about. If you care about your productivity, your productive pursuits, you will have less concern over how much freedom you are buying. If you feel obligated to share your creation with the world, the resulting monetary return is less important than the act of contributing. So like I said, this article is focused on creating business content and making a profit from what you create and contribute. But what I found interesting in this snippet is how it can be applied to our lives in Christ. Through prayer, reading the Bible, bonding together as Christians, we should grow in compassion for one another and for those outside the church. Empathy is something that I, I struggle with personally. Yeah, as a former Marine, you know, kind of hard-nosed kind of guy, it's a challenge for me to fully understand the emotions that I'm not feeling. I know very empathetic people, even sometimes to a fault. But even so, through prayer, Bible reading, and service, I find that God can soften my heart and help me to be more empathetic. I believe that God can also help you be more pragmatic and more focused as you serve and gain wisdom and maturity. At the end of the day, we should all strive to do as much as we can with what God has given us. In Proverbs 20, 13 through 14, it says, Love not sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will have plenty of bread. Bad, bad, says the buyer, but when he goes away, then he boasts. So finally, as we close, I want to look at the three at three more C's. Conviction, conversion, and consecration. The point of this message is to convict us, to fully give in to Christ. When we are interacting with, with the world, our purpose is to bring conviction of sin paired with the hope of salvation. We are praying for the conversion of the lost and their subsequent consecration to God. Everything we do is supposed to be done unto the Lord. In Colossians 3, 23-24, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for man, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord. Christ. So as a person who's born again and starts a new life similar to that of a newborn infant, seven rules that promote good health in babies can be adapted and applied to Christian spiritual health. Daily food, taking the, the pure milk of the word through study and meditation, fresh air, pray often or you will faint. Prayer is the oxygen to our souls as Christians. Regular exercise, put into practice what you learn from God's word. Adequate rest, rely on God at all times in simple faith. Clean surroundings, avoid evil company and whatever will weaken you spiritually. Loving care, be a part of a church where you will benefit from a pastor's teaching and his shepherding, his headship, and the fellowship of other Christians in the church body. And then periodic checkups regularly examined your spiritual health. As we closed, it's important that we recognize that we, we need to grow in our Christianity. We need to grow to our, towards sanctification. We need to be able to take the talents that God has given us and use them for the kingdom so that we have more to give back to the kingdom you know, years down the line of being a Christian than we did when we started out. But maybe. As we come to the end of this message, maybe you're not saved. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. And that's why this message is for you. So if I could have every head bowed, every eye closed, wherever you are, unless you're driving, of course, be safe. But I want to give an invitation. If you are, if this message is spoken to you or touched you in some way, and you know that you're not right with God, but you want to get right, maybe you're backslidden, maybe you've never given your life to Christ. I want you to signify that with an uplifted hand wherever you are, because I can't see it, but God can. And the reason I always do that is I want something to spur in you. I want your hand to go up because I want you to signify 
that this is hitting you. This is meaning something to you. And if you did that, I want you to repeat after me a simple prayer. It's just, dear Lord, I know that you died for my sins. And I know that I'm a sinner. I turn from my sin and I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. The simple remission of sin or the repentance of sin and accepting of Jesus as your Lord and Savior is salvation by grace. Grace was sitting there waiting for you to accept it. The way that you accept it is you say, dear Lord, you're God. Help me as I as I go and sin no more. I hope this message has impacted you. I hope that you understand that in order to be strengthened, even and I speak to the rest of the audience who's who's been saved for a while. You need to move forward in your relationship with Christ. You need to grow. If you refuse to grow forward, and then you'll become weak. So I live in. British Columbia, some, you know, a good portion of who listens is in British Columbia. And we, we have some crazy forest fires going on right now. We have them just about every year. And a lot of that is because we've had pine beetle infestations in a lot of our forests. So what a pine beetle does is go and it'll like attack a forest doing what it does. But because we as humans don't allow fires to happen as regularly as we, as nature would like. Whenever there's a fire, we put it out as much as fast as we can because fire's bad, right? But the reality is, is that the fire was always meant to be part of the ecology because it was meant to clean out the blight of the dead and unproductive trees and growth. The fire was meant to come through and the healthy trees would survive it. But because we've allowed the blight of these pine beetles and we've not allowed you know, people to go in and clean out the debris because we're not letting fires happen. We've allowed the dead to sit there and be, you know, a fuel for when the fires come. And then when the fires come, not only does it take out the blighted trees and the dead undergrowth, but now it puts at risk the healthier trees. This is why as a Christian, you have to move forward in, in Christ and you have to persevere and you have to move towards sanctification in, in order for you to be healthy. Because if you don't, not only are you putting your own life at risk, but you're putting the life of those around you at risk. So with that, I just hope that this message has impacted you. I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer really quickly because it's. I think this is an important message. Dear Lord, I just pray that we as Christians would watch our tongues. And be responsible for how we speak to the world. For when we see wickedness happen in the world, we should be able to call it out for what it is, that it's wicked. But we should also say we pray to see them turn to you and renounce their wickedness. If Manasseh, the the worst king of Judah, could, after many, many decades of being wicked, turn to you, to receive grace. Far be it for us as Christians to deny the opportunity for anybody else to turn to you. But that being said, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to grow in our faith and grow in our sanctification towards you as we mature in our in our in our walk with you. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. So again, thank you for listening to this message. I I pray or I hope that they, the, these messages speak to you. And I, I do ask you to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast so that we can get it out to more and more people. And of course, to reach out, let me know, you know, what you like, you know, that you've, you've been liking these messages. The, my contact info is all in the show notes on the, the main feed from RSS, but it's, uh, it, it does help us out, but if you do want to get in touch with us also, we're on Instagram at the Potter's House underscore Salmon Arm. And our email is Potter's House SA at iCloud.com. And you can get in touch with us that way as well. So again, God bless. Thank you. And have a great day. Thank you for listening.
listening to the PHSA Potter's House Salmon Arm Podcast. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Potter's House underscore Salmon Arm to keep up to date on what we are doing. Join the conversation and discover how Jesus Christ can revolutionize your life. Thank you.